Here we go. Uh, welcome to the second meeting of the Dynamics and Number Theory Seminar. Uh, Lem, if you are here, could you please announce what is going to happen? Um, hello, everyone. This is the second talk of the New England Dynamics Number Theory Seminar, and uh, we are very happy to welcome Sebastian Ricardo Salazar from University of Chicago. He will speak about um, uh, high gaps in the arithmetic Magrillus lemma. Uh, with applications to uh, uh, the cohomology of sequences of uh, uh, locally symmetric spaces. Um, hello, Th thanks a lot for the invitation. Okay, so uh, so, so this is a work in, in progress with, so, so there are like two projects. One is with M Nikolai Frasik and, and Jan Rambo, and, and the other is with Joe Chen, that was a graduate student here, and Homin Lee, that is a graduate student at, at Indiana University. Um, so, so, so let me just state some basic facts that I think most of you know. Um, so, so everything, like the notation I'm gonna use is, I'm gonna have G, which is a semi-simple Lie group, real Lie group, with let's say trivial center and, um, and a, an X that is going to be a symmetric space and, and G is going to be the, the group of isometries of, of this symmetric space. So when X is the hyperbolic plane, G is PSL2R or when X is the um, hyperbolic N space, this will be SON1. Okay, and, 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 the, uh, and there we're, Care about these groups called lattices, which are discrete subgroups. So when when you quotient x by gamma, you get an an orbifold or a manifold. So I'm gonna assume that gamma is always torsion free, just for simplicity. And um, I'll, I'll, <coughs> I'll, and and the lattice part also it comes with this condition that the volume is finite. Okay. So yeah, I think you, you should be pretty familiar with that. I, I wanted to tell you that please stop me at any time. M maybe like if I write typos or say stupid things, that would be very helpful. And what else? No, that's it. So important for us is going to be this class of lattices that I'll call the arithmetic lattices. So the arithmetic lattices, the definition is, is a bit tricky to explain, but it comes uh, from uh, some groups that of matrices that are defined by uh, some polynomial equations with coefficients in a number field. So, so the simplest example and, and, and the example that maybe uh, was the only example I knew like for five years or something was SLNC. Right in, in in SLN R, but I, I want to talk about other two examples. So one is SLN C square root of two, which is is not a lattice in SLN R because this is dense in SLN R in R, but it's a lattice in the product of two SLN Rs where where you, where you take a matrix and you send it to A and its Galois conjugate. So the Galois conjugate, you send in square root of two into minus square root of two. So yeah, so, so there is this other example that is a, a bit more difficult to explain, but it's kind of important for, for the talk. And it's, so, so we're taking here a quadratic form. And this quadratic form is going to be defined over the, like this field, q square root of two square root of three. And I, I'm, I'm gonna take this to be, these two numbers to be very special in, in such a way that all the Galois conjugates apart from the identity, so, so there are the four, like sending square root of two to minus square root of two, square root of three to minus square root of three. Okay, of, of, of all the possible embeddings of this, so, so this, always becomes negative. So this number, when you conjugate by something, uh, when you, you put a, a player Galois conjugate, 
this is going to give you uh, some positive numbers. So, so, so there are three Galois conjugates or embeddings of, of this field, such that if you look at the set of matrices that are defined in the field F, which preserve this form, when you look, you, you can apply conjugate to that, like a Wala, Wala conjugate, but, but they will like, so the identity would, would lie just here, because this, it will be one, this is negative and negative, but in the other ones would lie in these three. So there are like three embeddings on compact groups, okay? Uh, and so when you project this, this is a, 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 a lattice. This is a, a theorem of Borel and Harris Chandra. And when you project it here, this would give you a lattice in SO2, SO12 because the factor here is compact. So, and, and, and this is another example of an arithmetic group. So, so this would be a co-compact lattice in, 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 in the group of isometries of, of hyperbolic plane. Are, are there any questions so far? So the compactness of those other factors comes from positivity of the Galois conjugates? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, because the, when you conjugate, yeah, you get positive numbers, so it preserves a positive definite form. So, yes. yeah. Th thank you. Okay, so, so there are, various questions that you could ask about these manifolds or orbifolds, or like how do they look like? And, and these questions or what is the cohomology of this? And, and these questions are very important in number theory for reasons that I don't understand, okay? So there's a lot of, like of connections with the Langlands program. And um, so I'll, I'm gonna talk about some questions. So, 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 so today, I'll, the answer is that this thing, from this talk would be that these things look fat and kind of complicated. So, but first I want to start with a, like a very well-known question in number theory that has an, an interpretation in, in the geometry of locally symmetric spaces. And, and this question is, is this famous problem of Lemmer. So the question is, you take a polynomial, okay? And, and, and let's assume this polynomial is irreducible. Yeah, I already wrote that. And, and then you look at the roots. And the roots, and this is the unit circle, and you take all the roots that lie outside the unit circle, all of this, you multiply them, and that gives you a number that in norm is gonna be bigger than one. But the question is if there is some number epsilon such that this product is bigger than one plus epsilon, if there is a better bound than one, okay? So, so here I, I wrote it in, in a different way with this, Thing that I'm going to call the unnormalized height. So, so this is going to be just, just taking logs. And this log plus means if the number is greater or equal than one, it's just log. And if not, it's zero. So, so, so this is, maybe it's called Lemmer's polynomial. I don't remember, but it's, it's the polynomial for which this a height is known to be the smallest. Okay, and um, so, so this Lemmer problem, it is quite related to a conjecture about the uh, geometry of these locally symmetric spaces coming from arithmetic groups. So it says the following, it says that if I have a symmetric space, Margulis conjecture, of non-compact type and gamma is an arithmetic lattice, then the length of, of the C-stall 
of x mod gamma. So x mod gamma is going to be uh, assume assume this distortion free. So it's, it's a manifold. Then the length of the shortest loop is greater or equal than constant just depending on the symmetric space. Okay, and um, are there any questions? So uh, in this conjecture, uh, you don't need the higher rank assumption or anything. Margulis conjecture, just any arithmetic yes. lattice, any for every ar okay. Yeah, for, for any arithmetic lattice. Yes. Okay, thanks. So yeah. Lemmer's problem implies a positive solution to Lemmer's problem implies Margulis conjecture. So, 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 so there, yeah, that's what I wanted to say is ah, that, okay. you know, Lemmer's conjecture implies Mar Margulis conjecture, but, but the, the, um, the opposite is not, well, is not true, but it's, it's kind of, it, it's, this is equivalent to a, some weak versions of Mar Margulis conjecture and Lam, Lam Fam and Tilmani like have a, a nice paper explaining that and also saying that you know for, for these weak versions of Lemmer's conjecture, you only need them to hold for basically just certain families of Lie groups. Yeah, so so if you prove it for SL2R and SL2C, this Margulis conjecture. What this could imply is that Lemmer's problem is true for all the polynomials that have just two roots outside the unit circle, okay? So, so you, you might say how to find a polynomial with just two roots outside the unit circle. Uh, and so, so the idea is that, okay, if I have a matrix in, in one of these arithmetic, um, groups in SL2R, let's say co-compact, okay? Then, um, so, so the matrix, well, you diagonalize it, and these correspond to, to some loop in the symmetric space, just starting at X or X minus one, depends your convention. But this, the length of this loop is gonna be basically the length is comparable to this, um, to, to the log of this number lambda, okay? But because the group is arithmetic, you see when you take a lot of conjugates, remember this comes from a number field, when you take a lot of conjugates of this, all the Galois conjugates lie in the unit circle, okay? Uh, are going to be in the unit circles. So that's how you get like this type of polynomials with just two roots, one inside the unit circle and one outside the unit circle. Um, so, yeah, so, so I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit about the basic lemma that is well known. It's called the Margulis lemma about the, the geometry of these spaces. It says that if you there exists some epsilon that is just depending in the Lie group, such that if you have a discrete group, and then you look at some point in the symmetric space and you look at all the elements of gamma that this move just a little bit. So Okay, so, so I have just maybe something that just moved very few this point X, then this group is virtually solvable. Okay, so, so this is well known. I'm, I'm not sure how old it is, but yeah, probably 1960s, 1950s, 40s, I don't know. Yeah, so Margulis lemma, so, so what tells you that you cannot have Two, for example, in a surface, you cannot have, or a hyperbolic surface, you cannot have two short loops nearby, two very small short loops nearby, okay? Or, or that in dimension three, this is 
like a cost of a three manifold, a hyperbolic three manifold, that is where this, this group is actually Z2 abelian correspond to, to unipotent matrices. So, so what is like the idea of, of the proof? Just a reminder is that the idea is that if you have, comes from the fact that if you have two matrices and, and these two matrices A and B are very close to the identity, then when you take the commutator, this commutator in ORM is, is gonna be closer to the identity and, and actually is, is going to be something like delta one times delta two with uh, some normalization here in, in, the, in the norms, okay? This is, so, so it comes from this fact. And then what, what you do is you just like take a lot of commutators. You just, is something about commutators, iterated commutators versus discreteness, right? If you have two elements, short loops, they correspond to these two matrices and you start taking commutators and the discreteness eventually is gonna tell you that these have to be trivial. So, so this is the Margulis lemma. And I'm, now I want to tell you about one of our results that is, is the following, is, is this thing that is called the, we call the arithmetic Margulis lemma. So the arithmetic Margulis lemma, it's very similar to the Margulis lemma, but it says the following, says that there exists some constant just depending on G, such that if gamma is an arithmetic irreducible lattice, then you take this field, well, I call it F before, let's call it K, and you look at all the elements of gamma that move a point less than epsilon, but here you see I'm putting this factor that is gonna help me, it's gonna make, you know, it's going to increase this constant if K is large, then this group is virtually solvable as before. Are there any questions? Sorry, I think my iPad is lower than, than, than the computer. So when I highlight something, then it appears much later, but do you have any questions? So, so this is the arithmetic Margulis lemma. So this arithmetic Margulis lemma is gonna be a corollary of, of a theorem of Emmanuel Brulard. So I'll, 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 I'll explain this later, but before that, I want to give like a proof of this arithmetic Margulis lemma. Okay, maybe first I want to give some like geometric explanation. So, so the arithmetic Margulis lemma tells you that if, if you have geometrically, it tells you that there are no two short loops nearby if the degree of the trace field corresponding to the arithmetic group is very large. So, so the picture is gonna, maybe you have some very small loop because we don't know, or maybe you just have length one or something, whatever. But the distance between these two loops has to be like very large. So there should be like a lot of topology happening here because like the balls in, in these symmetric spaces because of the negative curvature, or not, yeah, features of negative curvature have exponential volume with respect to the distance. Okay, so, so this is, yeah. So this is the arithmetic Margulis lemma. Any questions? Uh, yeah, maybe um, Sebastian, I think P is, is X in your formula, right? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right, 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 thank you. So we, X. 
I also have a question. You said uh, when you read the theorem, you said irreducible. Do you need irreducible? Yes, irreducible. Yes, yes, irreducible. Important. And, and do you have an estimate on on uh, on epsilon g? Do, do you have um, yes? I mean, the one that we have is 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 one over something exponential e to the e to the d. Sorry, where this is the the dimension of the smallest or, or like the uh, the um, let's say g was SLDR, okay. So the, the, the dimension of the adjoint represent of, of the vector space in the adjoint representation, let's say. Yeah, so, so, so our estimate is not is not very good so far. So maybe, maybe we can push it. We hope we can push it with not too much trouble to one over e to the d squared. And maybe if we're very lucky to one over e to the d, but that would be like it would require maybe a lot of. Well, it would require a new idea. Okay. Uh, one more oh. question, Sebastian. Yes. Uh, uh, is there also a bound on the virtually? There is a bound, but I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, probably Manuel or like somebody else here does it knows it better than me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, there, there is a bound on the virtually, but that, that's that's true for group theoretical reasons. It's true for all uh, finitely generated subgroups of a linear group. If you fix the dimension, um, you, you, you know. So there just is, Jordan, Jordan theorem. Yeah. Basically, basically yeah. Jordan lemma. Yeah. Jordan theorem. Yeah. Okay, so, so so I'm gonna explain. Um, okay, first I'll, I'll state like this theorem with Mikolaj Frasik and Jan Rambo. That, that is, it was a conjecture of Gelander from 2001 that it says the following. Oh, okay, so we didn't prove the whole conjecture. Let, let, let me, we, we proved many cases, but. It says that the conjecture says that if X is a locally symmetric space, there exist two constants, C and D positive, such that if you have a lattice, so in our theorem, gamma arithmetic, but in his conjecture, this might be any lattice, apart from the case where X is H3. And if you have this, it says that this X mod gamma is homotopic equivalent. It might be homeomorphic, but we, we still don't have an argument for that. To a simplicial complex where the number of simplices and the valence of the vertices is bounded just depending on the volume. Okay, so, so the number of simplices is bounded in the volume. So that implies, for example, than, than the Betty numbers you can just bound them in, in terms of the volume. And, and, and the, yeah, there's the valence of the vertices, is the number of simplices that touch in any of the vertices of the simplicial complex. Okay, so it is basically somehow saying that the topology, at least the homotopy type is just bounded in terms of the volume. Um, so, how so how good like this is proven or uh, it, it is as follows so, so suppose you have that this x mod gamma suppose like margulis conjecture were true so, so this actually follows kind of easily from margulis conjecture so, so if margulis conjecture was true you would just take like a net where the points are like a distance part, like epsilon. And then you take the simplicial complex 
So, so you take a maximal net of, with a very small epsilon, and this epsilon just depending on, on this coming from the uh, Margulis conjecture. And then you take what is called the nerve of a covering. So the nerve of a covering is for each, you take balls around this, oops, I'm moving these things. You take balls around this, and then there is a vertex for each ball. And if two of the balls intersect, you put an edge between these vertices. And if three intersect, then you, you put a simplicial, comp, uh, like a triangle and, and so on. So, uh, and there is this theorem that I, I, I forgot the reference. It says that this is homotopically equivalent to your manifold. Are, are there any questions? So, so how do we prove this term? So we, we don't have like Margulis conjecture, but, but the idea is that we have like good control over the thin part because the, the thin part, there, there is a bound on like the smallest geodesic coming from like the known bounds of this Lemmer's problem. So, so it's known that this geodesic, smallest geodesic is, is greater than log of D to the cube, something like that, where D is, is, is this uh, dimension, this dimension K over Q here. Okay, so, uh, uh, but we know there's a big color here because of the, margul the arithmetic margulis. So, so the volume in some part here is going to be much, much bigger than, than the volume where the injectivity reduces more. So you have to, compute that and that's not easy, but yeah, that's what we were able to do, okay? And, and here we, we don't need the, the condition that gamma is, oh, no, no nothing, nothing. I, I was uh, going to say something about that we don't need to be um, torsion free, but, but for, for this term, let, let's assume it's, it's torsion free because otherwise not a money for them. Definitions get complicated. Okay, are, are there any questions? And maybe can, can you recall what uh, Gilander had in, in had proven in this direction already? Yes, uh, yes. So Gilander proved for um, so he proved some cases. Um, so one was non-uniform, non-uniform, all all the non-uniform and and. Maybe one of the things that where is non-uniform, the this degree of the trace field that is is bounded. Okay, so, so the smallest short geodesic by it's known to be just bounded by a certain constant. So so he proved it in that case, and also there were like some previous results of a, um, there was. Of, of Nikolai proved it in in the case of PSL two R and PSL two C and and he he proved ma, ma, much much more like he, he gave like really good bounds on bounds that we're not able to obtain. Um, so yeah, there, there was also work of Jean Rambo and Matt uh, that I, I'm not sure. Julie Matz, I think is her name. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure, but 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 that's that's what I know or I remember basically. I'm I'm sorry if I forgot to mention some names. Any questions? Okay, so yeah, I I I should make the remark that is this is false in in H three. As I was saying, so, so the full conjecture that it's basically what is missing is, is the case for HN and the complex hyperbolic space. So, so it's false in H3 because you know you, you can find infinite volume, infinite manifolds of volume less than a constant big enough. This is because of, of this dense surgery where you have some short geodesic 
you cut the short geodesic or neighborhood of it, and, and then you glue like torus, like solid tori there in weird ways, and, and, and this then is hyperbolic. And, and if the filling is weird, it's like very large, the, the topology of these things look very close. So, um, anyway, so, so this is false in H3 and, and it's open in these cases. Yes, so I, I want to talk about the, the proof of, of this arithmetic Margulis lemma. So the proof of the arithmetic Margulis lemma is going to be based on, on a notion uh, called almost loss by Andreas Tom. So, so, so the notion is as follows. So, so you take, here I'm gonna have G, any group, and, and I'm gonna take a word. And then when you have this word, this induces a word map, right? That is just sending any pair of the elements on what, what the word tells you. So, so this supposition just in two elements and it's just applying that word to, to these two elements of G. So, so the, the, the notion of law is a word such that the image of this word map is trivial. So if, if you plug any two elements, it gives you the identity. And this notion of epsilon almost law is an approximation of this. So it says that for epsilon, for this epsilon, there exists a word that is depending on the epsilon such that you can, the image of the word map is gonna lie in a neighborhood of radius epsilon around the identity. And um, so the theorem that Andreas Tom proved was that if G is a compact Lie group and epsilon is positive, any epsilon is small enough, then there exists an epsilon almost low. Okay. And, and the, the idea of, of the theorem so is first, there is some trick that allows you to lie in some neighborhood. So, so the trick, you know, could, could use the fact that, for example, if I take the, the first 10 powers of an element, so, so let's say I'm, I'm just in SU2, so, or SO3 that are rotations. So in the first 10 powers, there's gonna be one that is by a, something by angle less than two pi over 10 or equal to two pi over 10. And so, so this one is, is very close to the identity. And, and then you, you try to use this with the idea of taking commutators. And then, but once you lie in a neighborhood of the identity, it's just applying the, this fact that commutators of commutators get close to the identity. Okay, so, so there is like a nice question that I want to state that I really like is the following that it is to try to understand how fast you can make this convergence with a word of length n. So, so, so the question is if does there exist a sequence of words So, so these are words in F2, such that on, let's say, the, the, does there exist some epsilon and some delta, such that you can make the image of the word be in a ball of radius e to the minus delta the length of the words. So, so, so this is an open question and I, 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 I thought it was approachable for me, but I, I, I haven't succeeded. Uh, and I, I mean, we have tried a lot. I, I have tried a couple of years. Yeah, so, so, so there's, so, so, so Andreas Tom proved 
that you could do it with some pow small power here of here in the top. That is, so so you could do it. If you just take the idea of doing commutators of commutators, because when you take a commutator, you have two words of length n. The commutator has length four n. And when you have things at distance delta, then the distance is delta squared. So, so when you do the computation, that tells you that you can find words that have this order of approximation. But doing it with a constant smaller than that is, is, is very tricky. So he, do, he did it with a constant smaller than one half together with a student of him. Actually, a student of him was, has the best bound that is related to the to the uh, this phase most constant, what is the name? The, um, lambda squared equals lambda plus one, the magic constant there, okay. Sebastian? Yes. Is it known in SL2ZP, for example? In SL2FP? ZP, ZP. Ah, ZP? Mm. I mean, no, not, not that I, I know, not that I know. Because it yeah. should be maybe simpler because- So, okay, so, so, so it's like, it's basically SL2 FP, right? FPN, FP to the end. So, so Andreas, he has a paper where, where he gives like the smallest bound of a law in a finite group. And, and he uses some ideas of like expansion in, in finite groups. So, so, so from there he gets like a constant, but still, I, I don't think it, it can beat something like this, okay? Or I'm not sure if it's even possible in the, in, in the PID case. Okay, um, okay. Could you tell me- I think, me I think the, it's the same, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yes? Can you tell me the title of Tom's paper or when it appeared roughly? Um, the title of Tom, I'll do it at the Can I do it at the end? Because I don't remember. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but if you Google almost lost Tom, I think one of the papers will appear. There are a couple of them. I found the YouTube so, video. <laughs> Okay, so so now I'll I'll explain how this notion enters like into the proof of this arithmetic Margulis lemma. So the, the proof goes as follows: I, I have my group. I'm gonna suppose is SL2R and gamma torsion free because in this case the proof is much simpler. And then, okay, I'm gonna let D to be the degree of, of the extension. And so, so we have as before that if our lattice is arithmetic, co compact, then it has, it, it appears naturally as a subgroup of this, where this comes from the different embeddings of the field into the complex numbers, okay, into the real numbers. So, I have one that corresponds to the lattice and the other one are just going to be compact. And the idea is that these embeddings, that they have, the fact that we have a lot of embeddings is gonna help us. So it works as follows. So I'm gonna take some epsilon e to the minus 10 almost law, just arbitrary, very small, but this is gonna be a fixed word. And then I'm gonna, just, just to recall that here what is varying is the gamma. The gamma is varying and this D is what is varying. So this is gonna be a fixed thing. Then I'm gonna take this quantity. So the quantity is, I take the, uh, I, I see the distance more or less of, or I just compute W, the, the word applied to X, Y, minus the identity over all the possible Galois conjugates and take the trace of that, okay? So what's gonna be happening with this quantity? First, because it's arithmetic, then this quantity 
is going to be an integer. And um, yes, and, and I also claim that this quantity is different than zero. The, the reason is that these words, okay, just in the first embedding would be just W of X, Y. This correspond to a geodesic. So a geodesic that is going to be, maybe if it was a commutator, it would be an X, Y, X minus one, Y minus one, or something like that. I don't know, but it is going to be corresponding to an, a non-trivial geodesic. So it, it is because in a surface group, if you, you look at two elements, the group they generate is free. Okay, so, so this is going to be non-trivial. And then, okay, I'm taking this, just minus the identity, taking the trace, and I'm multiplying over all the Galois all the embeddings of the field in, in the complex number. So F is K here, sorry. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So, so what happens is that this quantity is gonna be an integer and, and it's going to be different than zero. So an absolute value is greater than one. And then we're gonna conclude from, from there as follows. So, so first is that this trace, so for example, for, for the first one that was just trace of W, X, Y minus the identity. So, so this is more or less, well, it's related to the eigenvalue, just the, the sum of the eigenvalues. So, so you could basically see that this is more or less e to the length of this geodesic that I was describing. Okay, and then there is going to be the things that are gonna help us. That is that these things for the, for, for the compact part lie very, very close to the identity. So this number is gonna be very close to zero for all the other terms of the product. So for the rest D minus one of the product, this is going to be smaller than E to the minus 10 times D minus one. Okay, so I have this. And, and then just, I, I, I take to the other side and apply logs. And what I get is that the length of W, X, Y is bigger than 10 um, D minus one. And, and this is the, but, but, but this is bounded by, let's say the, the length of W times the length of x plus the length of of y. Um, if I start at the same point here, or okay, yes, 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 yeah, th this is true. And uh, and then, well, this is kind of true. And then you divide by the point is that the length of x plus the length of y is going to be bigger than this thing that is constant, just depending on the size of W times D minus one. So D minus one, remember was basically this. Okay, so, so it comes more or less from, from this computation. And, and so that that's the proof in the case of SL2R. Are there any questions? So W is, is fixed here or? Yeah, W is fixed, W is fixed. And, so, and so the W yeah. just, it just comes from this 10 that I, I choose it to be e to the minus 10. It was, W is fixed. It's very important that it's not varying. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, th thanks for the question. So, so, this so epsilon, epsilon G is this 10 over W and you choose. Yes, w. Yeah. exactly. So, so, so to compute this, you basically need to estimate this, the, the size of this word. And, and the size of this word with the dimension of, if this was SLMR, I mean, the only size of like the word that we get is, is this e to the e to the m, and, and that's what, where the 
it comes like this estimate of, of the constant. So if, if we can get better words, we might be able to get better constant. Okay, so I, I wanted to explain that this is also related to the theorem of Emmanuel, that it's, it gives a, a proof of some of his results, simpler proof in some cases. And um, so let me explain this. So here, what you have is a finite set of matrices. Okay. That are so, such that all the entries are defined on, on are algebraic. Okay. And then I'm gonna take a field K such that contains all these GLDQ K contains all these matrices and give the following definitions. So the first definition is the definition of like the height of a matrix. So the height of, of a matrix is you take, you look at all the possible valuations. So in the case where all the entries were just algebraic integers, this would be just, you look at all the Galois embeddings of this matrix, okay? And then you, you apply the norm O, oh, and here there's missing some number, some normalization number that I, I miss in V. Okay, so there's some number. So for example, for, for, for the Archimedean valuations or, that are real or complex, when they're real, this is one, when they're complex, this is two, but when there are periodic valuations, when this is not just a matrix with algebraic integer as coefficients, then you have to, well, this number depends on, on whether this, uh, this valuation comes from a prime that it's inert or split. So, okay, there's like some number theory there. And, um, but just for simplicity, just, let's focus on the case where all are, the, uh, all the entries are algebraic integers. So, so there are no non-Archimedean valuations. Uh, and this norm here is the operator norm for some norm defined in K to the D. Okay, so, but, but for, for what I say at the end, it doesn't matter which norm. So, so then you define the height. So the height of this finite set is just the maximum height of a matrix. And there is the, the normalized height. The normalized height is, is this quantity here. So the normalized height is you take the height of F to the N divided by N and take the limit. And this limit exists because you can prove that this quantity is subadditive. And so for like a matrix, the height, it has to be with the norm, but the normalized height, it has to do with the eigenvalues of I, with the top eigenvalue of I or, okay. So, so the, um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to point out that, okay, that this, the height gap implies the arithmetic Margulis lemma. So it, it doesn't follow immediately from here, but like Emmanuel showed that, so, so, so let me state um, Emmanuel's results first, right? So, so it, it says the following, it says that there exists some epsilon just depending on the dimension. So just for any set, so here I put symmetric because our theorem just, we can just prove it in the symmetric case. So he proved it in general, he doesn't prove this. He, he doesn't need this. Then he proves the following that either the group is virtually solvable or the normalized height is bigger than epsilon. Okay. So, yeah, so, so, so in, so in joint work with Joe Chen and Homing Lee, we have like a new proof using just this idea of almost loss. 
that avoids some of, of the material that Emmanuel used that it was like this Belus equidistribution theorem. And yeah, he, he, well, he uses a lot of things, including some lemmas about the action in, in, in the Bruja Tits building corresponding to non-Archimedean places. And, and, and we also uh, avoid that. So the, um, there, are there any questions about this statement? So maybe again, do you have a, a good bound on, on on the on the constant epsilon here? No. Uh, this is given. No. The so the I thing have. is like, yeah, the, the constant f of the height we can get a bound, but of the normalized height, we have to use some of of, of the lemmas that you use. But 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 we can get a bound of the height just that is it's bigger than e to the e to the d. One, one over this, like the same bound that we had yeah. before. But we cannot do it better than, like for the normalized height, we, we, we would need a, something. It's, yeah. I wanted to know if you just knowing bound from this could get us a bound from this. I mean, could tell us how to get a bound from this. Yeah, so I saw, actually I was interested in this recently and, and, um... Uh, you can look on the archive. I have some some paper that goes in in this direction, not all the way to the heights, but just for uh, every local place. Um, mm -hmm. I have some effective uh, um, constants, which is polynomial. So I was hoping that maybe you can get some polynomial bound. But yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> very far from that. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the um, yeah so, so let me explain how this theorem implies um, the um, the arithmetic Margulis lemma, and again the, the proof is well as I said. It doesn't follow immediately from, from this result, but what Emmanuel proved is that you, you can find actually an element of, you can find an integer such that f to the n contains integer just depending on d and an element a such that the height of this is bigger than some constant that is also universal. And so, so once you have this element whose normalized height, so this is element in some f to the, sorry, f to the n is bigger than this constant, epsilon of d, then you see the height, it's just gonna be the, the the normalized height is just gonna be actually in the case of SL2R, it's just the height of the highest eigenvalue of the matrix. And 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 that's and 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 but you see there there is a one over k q. So this is bigger than the this the log of this okay so, so you have something in a ball of radius n just depending on d such that whose eigenvalue log of la, satisfy that the eigenvalue log of lambda that is related to the length of this is going to be bigger than epsilon d times k q okay and and, and so the, that's that's the proof. How much time do I have left? I I know it's supposed to be hour and fifteen, 
but I'm supposed to speak for 50 minutes. So I think I'm over time. You can maybe conclude in the next two minutes. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll just mention another result that we get with Mikolai Frachik and Jan Rambo. And, and this, this is related to an, a notion that is called the benjamin Chang convergence. So it says the following, it says that the theorem says that if we have a sequence of different congruence arithmetic lattices in some Lie group G, then this sequence of orbifolds co converges to X in, in this sense of Benjamin Ishram. And, and what it means is that if, if you fix an R and you look at the place in the manifold where the injectivity radius is smaller or equal than R, the volume of, of that is small compared to the volume, total volume. And this quantity as n goes to infinity converges to zero. So, so, so then from, and the, the idea again is that, you know, the, the thick part is, the volume is much, much bigger. And, and we have to compute, do, do some integrals to compute this, called like orbi, orbital integrals. To, and um, after we, we do this, then you obtain like these very nice results about convergence of, of this quantity. So you have convergence of, of, of this quantity that this is the size of, of the I cohomology with complex coefficients and you divide by the volume and this, this converges by to the L2 Betty numbers. But moreover, we can get some bounds. So that tell us that this quantity minus this, oh, sorry, this minus this is smaller than something of the order of the trace field. Okay, so, so look that here. Yeah, I'm not requiring that this gamma n have the, the degree tends to infinity. So when the degree tends to infinity, the arithmetic Margulis lemma help us. But in the other case, what helped us is, well, it's is basically ideas of Mikolai in, in his thesis using the um, Selber trace formula that I don't think I'll, I'll have the time to explain. And I'm, I don't think I would, I have, I can explain it very well as well. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so that's it. So are, are there any questions? So maybe can you explain again uh, the relation between the um, the this, the, Margul the Margulis lemma, uh, the f I mean the first part of your your talk and and this application. So how do you? Uh, you said uh, how do you how do you control this? No, I mean what what's what's wh where does the ingredient? Is help, what, where does the ingredient from the Margulis lemma helpful to deduce? Uh, um, for this proof? No, I mean, for your application. Uh, so this, yeah, okay. Yeah, so. yeah for, for this application, right? Or for yeah. another? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the thing is the arithmetic Margulis lemma tells you that basically if, if you have a small loop, where you know the injectivity radius is smaller than R, then there, there should be like a big color. For example, in, in rank one, that would be the case. Okay, in rank one, because you know, like the group that moves this point X very few, just maybe come from, from like the element corresponding to this geodesic, then you can find a big color around it. 
Yeah. So, so, so the, um, you estimate like, like you divide, you take a kind of an annulus in, of this big color and, and, and this annulus is gonna give you more co contribution here than, than the one that this, than the thing here in the middle gives you towards this. Okay, this is kind of a mess, but. but just, so, so, so that. So Mikola, he, he had this in his thesis for SL2C basically, right? Yes, yes. So, so, he, so, so the problem was that he needed, he had trouble when the degree of the trace field was going to infinity. Yeah. Yes, he used like, it was in computing like some orbital integrals. Yes, but he yes. did that. He, he, that's what that's what he did in in his thesis, right? For SL2C. Yeah, yes. for SL2C. So, but, but so, so here, we have here, some here. estimates on, on the orbital integrals, you know, that uh, that allow us to like show this. Yeah. So so maybe. I mean, uh, as far as I remember, at, at, at the end of his thesis, he also had some argument in the general case with um, with Jean Rimbaud, um, which used some um, um, I mean some result of Benoit, and, but but it 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 was qualitative and it, it didn't it was not quantitative. So do, do you know what I'm talking about? Or um, so is so this what you have here is 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 more quantitative. So you you have yes a, yes 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 yes. You have an yeah. estimate on, on so, this. So yeah, what we have is this estimate. Basically, we have that the volume of x mod gamma. So the parts where the injectivity radius is smaller than some small constant times the trace field is smaller than e to the minus another constant the trace field times the volume so that's what we we proved yeah okay okay that's great mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah here i should meant the size of the Are there any other questions? Um, I had a simple question. Yes. Um, in the epsilon almost law uh, yes. problem you, you raised, so it seems in, in your proof, um, you it wasn't important that W, the word didn't vary, just like that its length um, was yeah. bounded. It, it was, and it, it had to be fixed, yes. And then also it seemed like Maybe you were um, mostly interested in applying this to uh, algebraic matrices uh, in in SU two. Yes. Or 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 whatever the compact group is. Yeah. Um, so um, if um, the weaker sort of uh, 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 version of your question, where you switch the quantifiers, where you would say, given two elements in the group, can I find a a word of some length? So that you can approximate identity, would that be enough? Like suppose you knew bounds on the size of the world, because I think that's more related to yeah, things yeah, like equal distribution of random walks and so on. Yes, yes. So, so in, in the random walks, when the algebraic, when the, the entries are algebraic, you could do this with you know like the um, the length of the world actually just have to be okay. Maybe if you want to to get it like exponentially close to the identity, you just need a a word of length roughly n, but but yes. Yeah, so, so the thing is that we needed too many words at the same time. So maybe one way to improve this would be to, to consider the question that you have, like you know, a pairs of matrices x one y one x d y d and, and then you, you want to find a word such that gets them close to the identity all of them at the same time i see yeah so so you would need I just see. you just the word might depend also in these elements but but the length of the word has to be independent 
of the pairs. And of the group, and of the compact group. Right? And of the co co compact group, yeah, yeah. Of, of the compact. Yeah, yeah. so, so actually team. there is a conjecture, or, or I don't know, it's a conjecture, a question of Michael Larsen that is asked whether, you know, given any word, if you take the compact group large enough, this word is gonna be surjective. So, so there is no way of, you know, like just like fixing the words for, yeah. For like, but, but in your application, the compact groups uh, are like moving, there is yeah. a fixed list for G. Yeah. So, 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 so for yes, yeah, so, so this correspond. Yeah. So, so the, the the compact the dimension of the compact groups is bounded. So that's why we win because the the dimension of the compact groups is bounded. Yeah, just depending on the dimension of G. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, I'm not very familiar, but uh, so this yeah. work of uh, Borgen, Gumbert, Sarnak wouldn't okay. wouldn't help here. Um, like their spectral gap, uh, sort of. Uh, so, so it's some, something maybe, about speed of maybe 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 yeah speed effect distribution. Yeah, maybe like, I'm not sure how yeah. uniform it is if uh, on the compact group and. But I think if, if you fix the compact, but the thing is like, you know, I'm taking here, I'm taking product of compact groups, but if you fix the compact group, you have exponential. I mean, you can get really quick, as quick as you want. I understand. And okay. I think the, the rate also depends main, I think maybe on the, uh, just like the Diophantine properties of the. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that not, would, not yeah, really, that would be bad. Not really on the yeah. elements, but. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but, but yeah. here it seems to me that it's a different problem because you, you're you're looking for specific words that are somehow outliers to to the uniform to the uniform distribution. It's, it's not about distribu yeah. uniform distribution. It's about finding this word that that has the opposite effect of contracting everything to near the identity uh, along one path. So this word would be like one path where you multiply these elements in some order and you get very close to identity. But yeah. you know, if you look at all the possible words, then you're looking at well, and for all the possible words, you approximate everything. And so there will be one word where you approximate identity. It will depend on the pair. It would depend yeah. on the pair. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. But um, yes. I'm not sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's what you would like. But yeah, the, the thing is that, that the length of the word, as you said, depends on, on the diaphantine properties also of, of the elements that you started with. And, and that could be like trouble. I see. Yeah, that would be trouble, yeah. But maybe, maybe something there could be done. Uh, and maybe something weaker could be just could improve on this uh, bound of Tom and his student. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Just yeah, I, was, I, have tried, I have tried a lot. I have tried, like, you know, improving. I, I don't this know. This is too hard, I right? Like, you want to find one word that somehow works for the entire group. But maybe yeah. if one allows the word to vary with the to depend on the elements, but somehow still the length is controlled. The length of the word is. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I just wanted to say, you know, that <clears throat> we were studying this question, and then like an, a nice approach is just take arithmetic, you know, matrices and plug, and then maybe get a contradiction, and we couldn't get that, but we we got this. Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, this thing. So, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay, we shouldn't uh, forget one important uh, aspect of the talks that is giving a round of applause to the speaker. We kind of <laughs> left it out. Could be even un in an unmuted format, or this will do. Uh, so, uh, any other questions or comments? Maybe yeah. I have one, one last question. Uh, so. Um, you said you, you could avoid the use of uh, build, poetic buildings. Um, yes. See, in, in my work, I mean, they, they arise uh, essentially only uh, because I'm looking at arbitrary um, algebraic numbers, so matrices with uh, algebraic yes, integers. Yeah, we can also... Not just that, algebraic okay. integers. Yes, 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 yes. So, so here, when you look at lattices, the algebraic integers... Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I I didn't explain that 
kind of part. So, so it it's so the the idea is okay. It's basically the, the same. You you take wait. Let me. I, I, okay, I, I forgot the the pencil here. So so the thing is like this. You look at this quantity, but so if this quantity is smaller than something exponential, depending here, then then in that case, what we do is okay. You use like this product formula. So the product formula tells you that the um, the norm, the product of the norm in the periodic places of this this quantity the trace is going to be bigger than e to the c times k q sorry sorry is that making sense yes i mean maybe so yeah. so, so so it's it, yeah. so so if this is you know if this is small exponentially small then you can use the periodic place to get the norm of this exponentially big and then the trace of this is related to the eigenvalues of, of this so so maybe uh, just it comes from like this product formula for number fields that okay the product formula is just let me so the product formula is this that this is equal to one so from there if this quantity was exponentially small exponentially small then you get that the product of, of the non-archimedian of the valuations of, of this thing trace whatever minus identity is bigger than this but then this norm you, you can bound it in terms it, it's just Basically, in the non archimedian places, it's bounded by by the product of, of the highest eigenvalues of of. So you look at this w x y v maybe the the eigenvalues of of this. So the largest eigenvalue, let's say, in this valuation. And then from here, you get that the height of, of, of this element WXY is bigger in these periodic places. It, okay. it comes from, from there, yeah. yeah. And in the case where this is bigger than this, then you apply the same trick. Yes, sorry? Here, are you assuming that you are in in particular, S arithmetic classes, you have finitely many places, or no? You are not assuming that you have finitely many places. No, I'm not assuming there are finitely. So many. then, how do you choose this new? I mean, if you don't have finitely many places, maybe the product gets large, but not in one one particular new. Yes, yes, yes. So, but but there is one. I mean, the thing is that the height is the sum of the log of all all of them. So. So, so so this is basically I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question but I, I mean that yeah that, that's not going to affect you so, so, so these highs are normalized no in such a way that the, this thing calls so so that's the only thing that we kind of using yeah did that answer the your question? Yeah, it, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It, it may be just one valuation, and you don't have control over the valuation. You don't have control. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was a nice discussion, but I'm afraid our time is up. So let's give a, a round of applause of to the speaker again, and let me uh, stop the recording now. Uh, Come again next week. <laughs>